Would the 1978 Constitutional Convention please come to order? Hawaii's last Constitutional Convention was 40 years ago. Voters will decide this year whether to have another one. What is a Constitutional Convention and how does it work? Voters will also decide whether the state can tax investment property to raise money for education. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff. Tonight we take a break from our candidate forums to discuss the constitutional questions facing voters in the general election. In our first half hour, the CONCON. -con. Voters will decide if there should be a convention to make amendments to our state constitution. After a quick change, we will have opposing viewpoints on the other constitutional question, should the state be given the power to tax investment property to support public education? We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Our volunteers, PBS Hawaii friends and family, are standing by to take your questions. They look all happy and right now idle, so please keep them busy. We plan tonight's discussion with this question. It will be on the November ballot. Shall there be a convention to propose a revision of our, or uh, uh, amendments to the state constitution? I can tell this question is going to confuse a lot of people because I can't even read it. To date, Hawaii has had three constitutional conventions, 1950, 1968, and 1978. By law, the question on whether to have a con, -con must be put to the voters if the legislature has not proposed having one in a nine-year period. It's been 40 years since the last CONCON. -con. If voters say yes to having a CONCON, -con, what issues would you like to see included? Let us know. Now to our guests. Our first is Avi Soifer. He's the Dean and Law Professor at the William S. Richardson School of Law at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Our second guest is Peter Adler. He is a planner, mediator, facilitator, and principal in a professional network of consultants. And Peter, I'd like to ask you the first question because you've been actually studying this and talking to people about this. This vote, what kind of pressures are there on the voters to do this, to approve this? Because they've rejected it so many years. So um, one, it's a, it's a mechanically, it's a high bar to get to a constitutional convention. And we can talk more about that later on. Um, but I think that the, it has to be on the ballot, as you've said. And I think that there will be a lot of political aligning around this as the issue percolates and bubbles up in the next month. Uh, if the traditional thinking runs the way I've heard it, uh, unions, business, uh, existing political leaders will probably line up against it. People who are restless and uncomfortable will, uh, and want to see some changes uh, or want to sort of go above the heads of the existing leaders will be for it. You know, the um, uh, details of the 78 convention are kind of helpful in make, helping us talk about what this looks like. It's been a long time, 40 years. Uh, since it happened. So in 1978, the legislature appropriated $2.5 million for the CONCON. -con. Uh, I think you mentioned earlier they only spent about $2 million. They actually were under budget. In 2018, the estimated cost of a constitutional convention is $55.8 million. That's an estimate from the Legislative Reference Bureau. We'll talk a little bit more about why it might cost that much. The 1978 CONCON -con opened in July of 1978. It lasted 65 days. It was held in the old federal building on King and Richard Street. There were 102 delegates from 51 districts, probably from the, basically the House districts at the time. 30 women, seven altogether had held elective office, only a couple were actually still in office at the time. Almost half were under 34 years old. And the 2018 ballot question, shall the legislature be authorized to establish as, oh, I'm, I'm really having a rough night here. That's the next section. Have some shall, water, have a yeah, beer. Yeah, okay. <laughs> anyway, so, after, assuming the voters approve this, are those numbers the kind of thing we can expect, $55 million? You, no, well, I think that's one. I've heard other numbers running around, too. I think you could take the, let's say, $2.5 million and bring it up to today's dollars, and that would probably be a minimal minimal kind of thing. And who decides how so big much, it is and how long it is and all that That's stuff. the legislature. So if the voters approve, it goes to the legislature. They decide the length of time. It could be 50, you know, 51 delegates instead of 102. So a lot of the devil's in the details on the expenses of it, on how it's organized. Um, uh, obviously, for how important is this, is this document? And does it need to be changed? I mean, there's always talk about how 
constitutions are important to be fixed, but do you think our constitution needs to be changed? Well, I'm not going to take a position on CONCON, -con, uh, <laughs> although I would say that the law school would benefit, I think, if there were a CONCON, because -con, our law graduates and even current students would be all over that. Probably and they did the last office. time. As they were last time. As they were. And many of them came to public notice because right. of that. Uh, but uh, I think we do have a pretty good constitution. I think the basic question may come down to how risk averse people yeah. are and how much they think government is right now working okay, not working at all, or uh, great, or in what, need of what, fixing. What, what kind of risks are there? Well, one of the things that's important for people to know is that after the, the CONCON finishes, what they propose goes to the voters. So there's a check on what the CONCON does. Mm -hmm. And I think that's not being talked about very much. So after uh, they come up with all their proposals, the they voters have to? Still have to approve them. So what's the risk, though? Is there a risk to the public of people well, doing people dumb who, things? Or? <laughs> yeah. And there will be some things that I guess some people might think are unconstitutional. Uh, and we have a federal as well as a state constitution. Um, we have, I think, uh, a very widely respected state Supreme Court, uh, with some exceptions. Uh, some of the legislators seem not very happy with them from time to time. And we have very good federal judges. Uh, so that's another backstop. Uh, so there are a lot of checks on even what a CONCON would do. So one of the things that I have been talking to some of the previous CONCON uh, delegates who have now gravitated into senior careers in different areas, not just in politics. But one of the things that impressed me was that they've said, you know, uh, the, the 78 CONCON was a mirror of the times. It's a mirror of what was going on. And the question is, do our times warrant that? It's not just a question of the Constitution, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, sort of grumpiness about the legislature. They don't move on things. And so a CONCON becomes a, a, a way of moving on some of those issues. You know, one of the things that was really big in 78 was initiative, referendum, and recall, which was uh, narrowly defeated during the CONCON. -con. Um, Avi Soifer, is, is, is that a risky kind of idea? I mean, is that something that might be enticing, but then a lot of people will come out against it? Well, I think we, sh those of us who, who uh, study constitutional law see that sometimes what uh, the populace does looks unconstitutional even to a fairly conservative U.S. Supreme Court. Yeah. Uh, so they can come out against uh, allowing municipalities to protect gay rights, for example, which happened in Colorado and the Supreme Court struck it down. Uh, they came out against some open housing in California. Some people think California has become an ungovernable state because of uh, that popular approach because people when they say your taxes are going to go up, they vote against it, no matter what it is, and so on. You know, it was quite an impressive list of former politicians, uh, or current politicians, and that came out of the Constitutional Convention. Just a short list, Governor John Y. Hay, hey, Joseph Suki, the former House Speaker, Barbara Maramoto, longtime legislator, Leslie Hara Jr., still a state senator, Jeremy Harris, the former mayor of Honolulu, uh, there's a, quite a long list, Carol Fukunaga, Helene Hale. I mean, does, does a constitutional convention become a, a proving ground for, for, for young politicians, a, a place for ambitious people to go? And is that a good thing or a bad thing? Do you well, think? I actually think that's one of the, I mean, I'm neither for nor against, but I do think one of the effects is that it launches new political generations. It brings new blood into the system. And that, that's good. I, I kind of think that, in, you know, that kind of turn is actually healthy for a system. We, we have a fair, fair number of turnovers that go on in our legislature. We just had a few. But I do think, you know, younger, newer people will gravitate to try to be delegates, and that will launch their careers. We learned that our host was also launched as a young journalist. <laughs> that's right. right. That's, that's, right. Right. that's, that's important, too. Two very brief periods of actually working for a politician. And, uh, it was fun, but, yeah, I was staff. Just full of, I was staff at the Constitutional Convention for a delegate, which gave me some insights and... Uh, uh, I have to keep my opinion to myself, though. But, <laughs> but go, what other, you know, the Native Hawaiians, though, did benefit considerably from the 1978 convention. Do you think that there might be a sense out there in the community that, oh, let's not do this again because they might right. take those entitlements away? I've heard that sentiment. I've heard people say, you know, we, one of the fears that's out there is that uh, it will erode some of the gains that were made on public trust doctrine, on water commission, on yeah, OHA. Yeah. Native, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are fe collective bargaining. Yeah. So that, you know, there were gains that took place, uh, progressive gains in 78. And people would say, eh, I kind of worry. I don't want to see those things roll back. On the other hand, there's also a suite of issues that people would like to bring up on the table. So that's 
going to be the interesting part of the next couple of months. Uh, Dean Seifer, in, in, the, in terms of some of the things that were done, that was uh, a direct effort to benefit, uh, you know, a very important uh, ethnic group, cultural group, but um, there are others who are now pushing back against that considerably, and there was at least one aspect that was approved by the Constitutional Convention that, that, that only Hawaiians could vote for OHA um, uh, trustees that was ultimately rejected by the courts. Is there is there a risk the that, case, that right? yeah. they could they could actually do something uh, too progressive that they and and, and 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 that might cause pushback the other way? Well, I don't know what you mean by that, but there are people just following on what Peter said who say, well, OHA isn't what we meant to set up the way OHA is now working, for example. So one could say, well, we want to go back to what we intended, or we want to change OHA in some other ways. Um, so sometimes it gets hard to tell what's progressive. I agree, I agree with Peter that when you look back at 78, it was progressive for its time. And so the question now is, okay, we've got what we've got. Would it be too radical a step to change it? Again, there are some protections even after CONCON is over. You know, Peter, uh, we did show that picture of the 55 million estimate for a, a constitutional convention today. Um, and there is a question from a viewer right on that point. Why is the convention so costly? Should taxpayers be concerned about such a large price tag? But there's some ways of controlling that. There right? are. And the legislature, because they, they really control the dollars and the numbers of delegates, they can de decide whether they're, it's gonna, you're going to have to rent an outside facility or to use a state facility. I mean, those are cost questions. And so there's a lot of controls that can be put in place to keep costs reasonable. Who knows what could be done in terms of, uh, you know, electronics and internet work participation. I mean, there's, there may be lots of ways to do it. I, I don't, I'm not questioning the, the LRB's estimate. I just think it's only one estimate, and I think there are others out there. You know, uh, comparing our Constitution to others, it does provide significant strengths to public employees unions in this state, probably more than other states. Do you see that being a big factor if there is actually a con? To well, the measure? U.S. Supreme Court at the end of the term uh, did something very serious to affect and to attack uh, public unions. Mm -hmm. Remains to be seen what will happen next. A lot of that depends on the members of the unions and how are the unions going to try to get them to pay their dues if they don't want to pay their dues and it may be by a shaming list or something like that. Uh, but it is state by state as to what the law is going into that constitutional question. Another big thing that ends up on the table in a constitutional convention is the electoral process. You know, how they can actually change how many representatives there are in the state, whether we have a unicameral or bicameral legislature, all those multiplicity of things. Um, campaign spending uh, nationwide was affected by the Citizens United case. Mm -hmm. Could a convention come in theoretically and have Hawaii as a state do things that the federal Supreme Court has said you cannot do? No, when you put it that way, but there are a lot of things I think that can be done even with Citizens United on the books. And corporations are actually creatures of the state. So the state can regulate corporations. From that, it might follow that there are some things that the state can do as a matter of we want to control our corporations. Now, there aren't that many in Hawaii, but there are still some. In discussions with people, who, again, I've been talking to people on all sides of an issue, this issue, and one of the fears is that we would see open a floodgate of uh, new money coming into the state, external money from the, the mainland and from the uh, fairly right wing organizations to prop up certain delegates and certain issues. So you could you could imagine you know an in, inflow of uh, dollars, and Citizens United sort of puts tailwinds behind that. Um, help me out a little bit more. So you, what you're saying is that you could see outside money coming in to try and influence who the delegates are and, and what they do? Yes. What issues I would mean, that, that would be around? Well, I mean, let's say you wanted to shift from, one of the issues in 78 was whether judges should be selected or elected. So I'll imagine there was a proposal suddenly, let's go to elected judges again. So you could see, you could imagine certain right-leaning uh, judicial programs saying, well, yeah, we want to support that. So I, I, don't, I don't know that they would, but I'm, I'm saying you, you could conjure up a number of circumstances, and it's one of the things that I've heard uh, people are worried about. How about Russian money? <laughs> could be. <laughs> um, yeah. the, and on, the, on the issue, though, of electoral changes, you know, we just had a primary election where the uh, Republican Party is practically irrelevant, where the uh, turnout is so low 
Do you think that improving our electoral system might provide an incentive for a constitutional convention? Let, let's change things to help balance things out. Or it could be that the, the a con con springboards those changes. As they could say, we're going to go to all mail uh, voting, or we're going to go to mandatory voting. I don't know if they could do that one, but oh, mail, it, M A I L. Yeah, okay, yeah. I just no, 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 no. Carol, there, come I thought, on. Well, that was pretty radical. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or, or uh, for example, what do they call the instant runoff method of voting? I mean, there are options, and a constitutional convention could say, let's pick that up, let's put it out there as a proposal, let's debate it and see if we want to get it on the ballot. Mm -hmm. So it could be the other way around. It could be along with term limits, initiative, and all kinds of things. I think there's a lot of county issues that may come up, too. I for example? Um, Hawaii is one of the only, it, I think it is the only state that has no political subdivisions below the county level, no municipalities. We're one of, I think, the only state. And yet there's tremendous pressures for community consultation, but who do you consult with? And so that's one, giving them more taxing authority so they can raise their own revenues. I mean, I think those are issues that might bubble up in a convention. Um, what do you think of that issue in the sense of, you look at Hawaii's state government, it's very centralized, mm -hmm. and the counties are very limited in their power. Do you think there would be a lot of pressure to give more home rule? I think there well might be. Uh, the basic law of uh, state and local government law is that the state really has the authority. So if the state really comes to blows, as it were, against the county, the state wins. Um, and then in terms of the uh, uh, union, the impact of unions, how is our constitution um, protect unions in this state uh, more than other places? I know there's privatization rules and so on. Um, is it possible that you think, that how, do, how will the unions be involved in this process, do you expect? In, in, the, in a con, -con? In, in all the way, the election process and into the constitutional convention itself. Uh, I, I don't know, I don't know the, good, the answer to that. I do think uh, that one of the products of the 78 con, -con was a strong collective bargaining regime and law. And it's possible that you could say, well, we want to make that, some people would say, we want to make it even better, stronger. And other people say, no, 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 wait a minute. So I think that's the kind of ferment that would be created by a con, -con on that issue. Um, you know, we, we do have this, the privatization provision has been used repeatedly to prevent the government from hiring private companies to do things. Um, do you expect that private business might start participating in pushing candidates or pushing issues? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, a couple questions from our viewers now. They're starting to come in with some uh, specific questions about issues, and you guys can do the pros and cons with this. It's, I don't think either of you are picking sides on anything, which is okay. <laughs> uh, should the CONCON -con abolish the lieutenant governor position? What's, what's the pro and con of that? Well, the, uh, the lieutenant governor position, it is true, does not have much that is specified in law as to what the lieutenant governor should do. It doesn't mean, however, that it couldn't be important. It, a lot depends on who's the lieutenant governor. And of course, in part, it's uh, a launching pad, uh, name recognition and all those other things. I think it was very striking that we had very capable people running for lieutenant governor. Yeah. So each of them had in mind, I think, not just one's own ambition, but doing some things. And in, in many states, uh, there are other elected positions that we don't have, an elected attorney general, for example. I mean, Secretaries of State, yeah, I mean, for yeah. example, yeah. So you could get more elected positions at the top of the ticket that might attract more people to the ballot. Here's a question from a, a, a person who says, I think we need a con-con, but after Saturday, I have no confidence that we'd get the delegates, voters, turnout engagement necessary to ensure that it will work or that it will have the best interest of all of Hawaii's people at heart. It's a pretty interesting question. Well, and the big problem is turnout, right? And it is embarrassing how few people vote. Um, and would this be even fewer? I mean, it's hard to, to tell uh, what it would do. Um, I think, uh, on the other hand, we are a state that has had political engagement in the past, and one could say maybe this would uh, rekindle that kind of interest. Yeah, I, I, I think that's right. I think one of the things, I think one of the things that uh, you could fairly well predict is that the opposition to a con, con will be highly organized, and those who are for it will be quite, you know, diverse and chaotic, and there won't be a, a center of, of proponing, proponents. So uh, in that, you know, in that situation, uh, it, you know, I, I think 
you know, it's unlikely, I think, that, that we would actually probably have it. I'm skeptical that it would actually do it, one of the things coupled that, with the turnout problem. And one of the things Peter alluded to before, but I think it's important for people to know, is there are judicial decisions that say that blank ballots count as no, which means you really need a super majority to or get a yes. Or overvotes where you have a flawed, flawed thing. I voted for two candidates, you can't do that. Right. right. So um, here's another question from a viewer. Uh, they're asking about multi-member districts. We talked a little bit about that, but uh, do you think that, I mean, you mentioned uh, there might be a number of proponents. I would guess the Republican Party would be one of them, but if, if the proponents are scattered and the, the opponents are unified and funded, uh, and then you get low turnout, yeah. Yeah, it gets pretty discouraging yeah. for those who might want to That's try right. this. So it's going to take people who really feel a passion for some kind of change to push this. That's where it's got to come. You know, somebody's got to say, "I really want to improve the county government, and we got to give decentralize some power, or I want to decentralize the board of education, or whatever it is." People who get passionate about issues will see this as a way of doing things. And part of what I I, I may be wrong on this, but my sense is that con cons sometimes spur things to happen that the legislature didn't do. They could have done it and they didn't do it. I mean, I'm not sure why the legislature couldn't have passed, uh, had a water commission or yeah. created an OHA. I mean, they could have done it, they didn't. So this becomes, you know, a catalytic moment, if, if it's to be. And we're not, as you noted, gonna disagree with each other. So just adding uh, to what Peter said, um, it may be that a lot of these things that people want, the legislature could do. So then the question is, okay, public, do you think it's really important? Why isn't the legislature yeah. doing it? Well, uh, technically, the legislature could do anything. That's right. They, Basically, they can, anything the they, town they can, can do, the up. legislature can do. Yeah, they, I mean, our next segment of our program is going to be about a constitutional yeah. amendment proposed by the legislature. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing that I, I want to note today, it was kind of a, a, a sad moment, is the passing of... Uh, Bill Patey, William Patey, who was the president of the ConCon, -Con, uh, you know, 40 years ago, uh, and we should acknowledge. And an impressive guy. Very impressive. Yeah, war hero. Yeah. Uh, he was a, a great gentleman. And humble. humble. Very humble all the time. The, the, the plantation at, at Wailua, he ran that plantation, and he always remembered people, could look you in the eye. It was fascinating to see his effect on that constitutional convention. You know, so it was, we should just, yeah. you know, our best to his family and, uh, and, and, yeah, and also to remember that interesting moment where that guy who was probably relatively obscure rose up, eventually became the director of land, yeah. you know, and so mm -hmm. on. So he's an interesting he's character. He's a good director. He's a very, he's very good career, great uh, career. Here's a good question from another voter. Uh, you know, how can we educate viewer, voters on amendments? This is a whole secondary process. After their past, there were scores of amendments that were on the ballot. Are, you know, is, are the voters engaged enough to make good decisions about those things? You know, there's, a, there's an interesting process that some friends of mine are uh, toying around with trying to put together for something like that, where you have citizen juries who debate an issue and then they publish both sides of that and then they take a vote and they put it out there instead of the usual lobbying campaigns. This is coming out of California and Oregon. Yeah. Yeah. Keith uh, Matson and Colin Moore and a couple others, they're exploring this. And it's on for ballot measures. So you can imagine a bunch of measures coming out of the ConCon -con and the citizen, a citizen jury, if it got organized right, could spend some time. And, and makes a recommendation. Yeah. They know it's not binding, but they're trying to Which educate. is different than having the lobbyists, you know, work Yeah, out. you know, so we've got a situation where um, the legislature does have the opportunity to lay this out. Do you feel like they should avoid the legislative model that they used the last time? Are there different models that could make it look like a completely different thing that people might be more excited about, more interested in, and maybe more prudent in this process? That's too hard a question. Give it to Avi. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a basic belief in, in one person, one vote, right? And in fact, that is to some extent required by the federal constitution. So there's only so far you can go to take it away from the voters as it were, but the preferential but voting is going on in Maine. But you're pointy intellectuals making the decisions, yeah, right. we try exactly. to avoid that. So, so in Maine they have this preferential mo voting thing yeah. that's about to take effect. And so if your number one candidate doesn't need your vote, then you go to your second one and so on. So that's... So you're not going to make an opinion, but make a prediction. Are we going to have a con-con or not? I would guess not, if, I would, had a, if you were pushing me on it, but that could change in the next month. 
it, we'll see how this, we're just early, it's early days in watching how this issue is bubbling. One right. of the other things that's interesting, and you might talk to your next panel about, is whether these two amendments side by side create a confu further confusion. So, because that was put on by the legislature, but the CONCON -con is uh, mandatory. Sort of sending a message that we can change the Constitution, but you can change the Constitution if you want to, but we could change the Constitution, so maybe <laughs> leave it to Possibly. us. Possibly. <laughs> okay. Well, very good. Well, thank you very much, and thank you all for joining us. Let's thank our guests, Avi Soifer from the University of Hawaii Law School, and Peter Adler, Pleasure. mediator. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. <laughs> right. We're going to do a quick change, and we will return in a few moments to hear from two new guests on the ballot question of whether the state should tax investment property to support public education. Please enjoy this Hikino story from Eva Mackay Middle School first. We'll be right back. I had a student in here who told me, you know, Mrs. Martin, last year, I hated you. I said, really, you hated me? Still hate me now? He goes, no. I'm like, so what's the difference? How come you don't hate me anymore? And he said, because I got to know you. Mrs. Jerry Martin, a vice principal at Eva Mackay Middle School in Eva Beach, has a reputation for being the toughest administrator at the school. However, she has grown accustomed to the thought of students calling her mean and being frightened by her. I think there are students that think I am mean. Rumors that people said about Miss Martin was that She's mean and like the way that she used to look at them was like, like they didn't like it. I thought she was kind of strict and harsh. Despite what students may say, Mrs. Martin's mission goes much deeper. Growing up, I didn't like the way my life was. And uh, I was a very, very angry person and being an angry person, um, if anybody looked at me the wrong way or said the wrong thing, I'd lose it. I had a really bad temper and took my anger out on, on people and they didn't deserve that and had to take responsibility. And now um, realizing that I had hurt so many people, promised that I would do everything I can to, instead of hurt people, help. To make up for her past mistakes, Mrs. Martin began serving her community by coaching sports in hopes of helping others. When I was involved with community sports, there were a lot of students who, who didn't have family that would come to their games. Um, they'd be embarrassed at potluck, on potluck days because they wouldn't be able to bring anything. And... Um, so it was those, those individuals that um, I took in that would come home with us and, and stay. And sad thing is some of, their, some of their families wouldn't even call to check on them. But um, I think being able to, to not just take care of my sons, but to be able to take care of the greater family, which is the community. Although some students may think that Mrs. Martin is harder on them, she only wants to steer students towards the right path. She helped me with problem situations, like when I would fight with other students in school, and I always get put in her office. She always like tells me stories about the same thing that I'm in, and that I'm not the only one who's in this situation. Even though you think that she's mean, she's not. She's a very caring person. For me, every individual matters. Every individual has the potential and the right to be happy and successful. Even though Mrs. Martin may be tough on the outside, her caring nature shows students that we can all grow from our mistakes. Thank you. This is Christina Overly from M. Mackay Middle School for Hiki No. Have fun. Aloha, welcome back. For this next half hour, we are featuring two guests who have opposing views on the ballot question of adding a state tax on investment property for public education. Please continue to email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Our volunteers are standing by. Here they are again, eagerly waiting for your calls and taking in some calls, I see. 
Last spring, the legislature approved a bill that puts this question before the voters. Shall the legislature be authorized to establish, as provided by law, a surcharge on investment property to be used to support public education? Let's hear what our guests think. Our first guest is Corey Rosenley. He is the president of the Hawaii State Teachers Association, which represents 13,500 public school teachers across the state. Our second guest is Sherry Menor McNamara. She is the president and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii, which has 2,000 business members in Hawaii. Let me start with you, Corey Rosenley, from HSDA. This was your proposal at the legislature. Uh, supposing it passes, how would this work? How would, this, how would you decide how much taxes, who gets taxed, and that sort of thing? Well, I think even before we get there, we've got to ask why. Why do we propose this? Um, and I want to say that, you know, first of all, we have some great schools, and we have amazing students, and we have people working really hard. But for too many of our students, right now we are facing an educational crisis. For the first time this year, we had over 1,000 classrooms without a qualified teacher. And what that means is, for many of those classrooms, we have substitutes in those classes. Um, you may have a substitute teaching, speech, uh, teaching Spanish that doesn't know Spanish, or teaching calculus and doesn't know calculus. Um, our estimates are that about a third of our students, or tens of thousands of students, every single day go to school and have at least one teacher that's not qualified. When it comes to special you, education let, in the state. Me, I just want to interrupt yeah, you for sure. a second. Because, because, I mean, I think that you could make the argument very well that the schools are underfunded. Well, and, sometimes and, people don't make that argument. And I think that that argument is not made enough. I think that that's why we need to do this. So, so OK, good. So uh, my question was, so what happens after this? Does, who decides how much taxes and so on? So what would happen right now is this is going to go to the people. And the question, the first step is, uh, we are hoping people are going to vote yes on this constitutional amendment to fund our schools. And then when that does pass, then the legislature is going to have to work on the enabling language. Uh, and there are certain parameters that we're looking at. First of all, we've been working on this for two years. And what we're looking at is to look at second homes over a million dollars in order to bring in something between two to four hundred million dollars of additional funding for our schools. So how much does that work out to as, as, a, as a number of percentage? Two percent, three percent, four percent additional? Depending how you work on it, it's anywhere from 10 to 20 percent more. A 10 to 20 percent? I mean, we would love to have more than that. Uh, we are probably about a billion dollars short of what our neighboring districts do or what similar districts do. But we've been underfunding for our schools for so long that that's why we're so deep in our hole right now. Uh, Sharon Menor, Mike Navarro from the Chamber of Commerce. I mean, you, you folks are coming out against this. Do you feel the schools are adequately funded or is it more about how you get the money? Sure. First of all, oh, the Chamber is part of the Affordable Hawaii Coalition. And I'd like to state that we strongly and wholeheartedly support public education, our teachers and students. I'm a proud public school graduate, K-12, from Hilo. And so I certainly know the positive impact my teachers had. In fact, I just went home to Hilo and ran into my 90-year-old teacher. Uh, so I certainly express my appreciation to her. Uh, the concern is the amendment is so broadly written that it can apply to any type of property. And I know uh, the $1 million has been out there, but this amendment does not apply to, again, all properties. So it could be properties under one million or over. Uh, so the way it's probably written is what concerns us. And we believe that this amendment, if passed, it will increase the cost of living, it will increase real property taxes, and it will have an impact on affordable housing uh, and potentially increase rents as well. And finally, there is no guarantee that the money will go towards teachers and students. Uh, and so for those reasons, we do not support and we oppose the amendment. Do you feel that, how do you feel about that? Well, and that's the thing. Uh, if you look at this uh, situation, the reality is that corporations and outside investors, they can't vote in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And there aren't many multimillionaires and billionaires. So the only way they're going to win is by creating fear. And they're actually going to try to get people to vote against their own self-interest. This is really a question about investors versus Keiki. Uh, and which one are we going to choose? Um, the investors pretty much are only concerned about their bottom line. But if they're successful, our schools are still going to be underfunded. We're still going to have tens of thousands of kids that are not going to be able to get a quality education. And the question is, what are we going to choose? Are we going to choose our keiki, or are we going to choose investors? And I say we need to choose our keiki. Do you feel that that's the question? Uh, well, <clears throat> when 
think of investment real property, it's a bit misleading because think um, big companies or outside foreign investors coming in and buying these multi-million dollar uh, buildings. But again, the way the amendment is written applies to all types of um, properties, including residential and commercial. So let's say uh, grandparents invested in a property, a walk up, so that one day they can turn it over to their kids or to their grandkids. Or how about working families right now investing in another property so that one day when they retire, they can live in this property they invested it in. Or take businesses, commercial leases, those will go up and small business will be impacted by that. Their leases go up, then the cost of goods go up. Our favorite Okazuya or plate, favorite plate lunch place, the prices will go up. Because again, going back to the amendment, it does not specify a dollar amount. It's very broad and vague. I'll let you be specific about your response to that. And, and that's exactly what I see. This is exactly what they're going to do. They're going to try to make this broad tax. They're going to try to make everyone afraid of it. We've been doing this for two years. Uh, and we've been working on this. And you know, what we are targeting are second homes over a million dollars. And right now, we have these uh, investors. Uh, about one third of all property tax in Hawaii are actually paid by people that don't live in Hawaii. Look at Trump Towers. They sold out $700 million worth of property in one day. And if these people can come to Hawaii and be able to spend $700 million, then they should be able to invest in our keiki as well. Let and me, okay, I'm, I'm interrupt for one more time because we only have a half hour show and I have a pile of questions already and I want to get to them. First, let me take a look. Let's take a look at the question one more time because it, it sounds like this is very important and particularly the, the Chamber of Commerce because some of the things that you're talking about, the $1 million, uh, for example, specifically is not mentioned in this question. The question is, shall the legislature be authorized to establish as provided by law a surcharge on investment real property to be used to support public education? <laughs> investment real property is a, a broader category than just $1 million homes. You know, So I mean, the question that came up from a viewer, uh, isn't it true if the legislature wants to, they could move 100% of school funding to property taxes? Of course, it would exempt owner-occupied property, but beyond that, is it possible that the legislature could go, aha, and just shift it all to property taxes? Well, legis like, legislators like to get reelected, and if they try to do that, they wouldn't. Um, and this is, if you haven't been through this, we have been. In fact, legislators, if anything, have been talking about homes over $1.5 million or $2 million. Um, and and the, we do, at one some point, got to think about what we are trying to do with this money. Uh, Hawaii schools, we are 45th in the nation in poor pupil spending. Uh, we do not invest in our schools. Uh, we spend about $6,000 less per pupil. Uh, every other state in this country uses property taxes to fund our schools. We are the only ones that don't, and that's why our schools are underfunded. Let me ask uh, Chairman or McNamara on that, on that same point. If indeed this becomes a schools or rich outside investors question. How do you respond to that in saying, you know, do you feel there's other things that should be done? Do you feel the schools are funded adequately or do you feel that there should be some mechanism other than this? I think, you know, anything to, to support public education, right? And we need to look at all options. One, the legislature did pass a couple of laws uh, in previous sessions that would help provide revenue to the Department of Education. Two, we need to, DOE should go through a thorough audit to find out what are, what are the areas that need improvement? Where are the resources going? And we don't know that. Uh, and three, I know uh, Corey mentioned $1 million in our properties. According to the County of Honolulu, uh, that amounts to almost $39 million. And so that's not nearly enough of what the $500 million goal that uh, Corey had mentioned um, in, in public. And so there's still this big gap. But again, going back to the amendment, it does not specify uh, the, the, uh, what the, the minimum level of the real uh, investment real property should be. It's just too broad and it's going to impact local as well as well as the foreign investors, but definitely local um, owners of real property, property investment. Um, go ahead. And let's make this clear. Uh, for years, HSTA has been trying to advocate for our children and trying to advocate to improve uh, funding for our schools. And I have not seen the Chamber of Commerce sitting in those legislative hearings trying to advocate for more funding. Mm -hmm. um, you know, no matter how you look at it, we do not fund our schools properly. 
Um, we spend about twelve to thirteen thousand dollars per pupil, and that's about fifty percent less than mainland schools do. In fact, our private schools in Hawaii they can spend twenty to thirty thousand dollars per pupil. Um, at the end of the day, and we have to take every single student, whether they're special needs or they're from uh, different countries and don't speak English. Over half of our students are economically disadvantaged. Are, are you saying that the business community has been um, one of the reasons that our schools are underfunded? No, but this is the situation that's going to be like this: is that if this fails, they're not going to come in and say we need to fund our schools in a different way. This is not multiple choice. This is our chance. This is the chance that we've tried for decades to get to this point. And the sad part is, you know, they're going to do whatever they can to try to get people to be scared of this. But at the end of the day, if this fails, there is nothing back up. Our kids are still going to be at the situation in a crisis level. This is our opportunity. You know, most states do use property taxes to fund school systems. Are you guys against that in general, or are you just um, opposed to this particular amendment? Would you support some property tax uses for schools? Well, our state is different because the state constitutionally is uh, the one that is responsible for the administration and the financial responsibility of the de um, de Department of Education, unlike other states where it's more county run and they have local school boards. And so we're in a different situation. And it's not so much implementing fear, it, it's not fear, it's educating our public because again, going back to the amendment, it applies to all investment real properties. And uh, you know, it's, it relates to going to legislature. Uh, the business committee does do a lot non-legislatively. We uh, do, c donate a lot of goods and services and we support where we can. In fact, the chamber, chamber right now is working with a few schools to help connect the business community with teachers and students to ensure that there's this relationship uh, and ensuring that the students are prepared for the future jobs. And so non-legislatively, yes, but in terms of legislatively, Let's talk, let's have that discussion moving forward. So uh, we're, we're we hundreds of millions of dollars short. Where do you, as you as the Chamber of Commerce believe we should, who should we tax in order to be able to bring in that revenue? We need to look at all options again. Uh, DOE has not gone through a thorough financial audit in recent history. But even if we were at 100%, to. okay, even if we, I mean, an amazing thing happened, they're at 100% efficiency, we would still be 45th in the nation in per pupil expenditures. There's got to be a point we do need to raise additional revenue. And, and Daryl, when you first brought the first question, everyone agrees we need additional revenue. There are some that don't. And that's why we need to make people aware of, I mean, teachers are, are on the front lines. We are aware of these problems. Well, and that's why we're asking that we've got to find a way. And the question is, are we going to tax the rich? Are we going to tax the poor? And this is the best way that everywhere else does it. Let me ask this oh. question, though. I'm sorry. It's okay. Uh, do you feel that the legislature, you say the legislators, if they, if they shifted everything to property taxes, they wouldn't get elected? Well, the fact of the matter is they're the ones that, you know, in your mind have not been funding public school properly. Do you think that there's any way within the existing revenue of the whole state that they could properly fund it just by changing their priorities? And that's the thing. There's no magic pot that's going to fund our schools. And often what's happened is, is the question of do we take care of our kapuna or do we take care of our keiki? And as health care costs have risen and people are living longer, that's taken a larger share of our budget. And over a period of time, the uh, budget for education has decreased and has not kept up with the cost of living. In fact, Hawaii spends the least percentage of both state and local taxes towards education compared to any other state in the entire country. The last. I know I interrupted you, but go ahead with where you're all right. Yes. OK. <laughs> OK, so um, a couple of callers here, and I'm trying to organize these, they're talking about other places that they'd like to see this focused. For example, short-term rental property tax, specifically. Um, is the, when you, if you get this amendment passed and you're at the legislature, how much are you going to be in a driver's seat on things like that? Would you think that that alone could generate enough money if you focus just on vacation rentals and so on? No. Uh, and that's why we've done this. It's taken a long time to get to the point where we've gotten. Uh, and there's not a multiple choice. Um, there's not things like the lottery or people have said marijuana or all sorts of things. In each of those cases, none of them bring in the revenue that would be needed. This is the best way to do it. And that's why we've gotten to this point. 
Uh, let me ask a question though. Investment real property. I've got a caller here. What is considered an investment property? The, the suggestion it could be is that it could be any kind of uh, business property. Uh, how do you make sure that it's only on these second owner homes, offshore investors? I mean, you talk about offshore investors, but an awful lot of them are owned by local people. Actually, they're not. Um, most, like I said, about one third of all of our properties are actually owned by non-residents, and this would be able to take a homeowner's exemption. So if you, let me put it this way, if you own one home, you won't have to pay this. And it doesn't matter the price. If you own a one home and a condo, you won't have to pay this. It's only for those that own a second property over a million dollars, and those that are buying they, a home in Hawaii are, will not but, have but that ability. That, that's not what it says. I mean, for example, if I downsize and I rent out my house and I move into a, a condo and I rent the condo, this, that would be an investment property, right? If you have two properties, again. No, if I rent a condo and I own a house and I, and I rent out my house, that becomes an investment property, right? So when so. we were looking at this, and we have many legislators on record specifically saying that they're looking at second homes over a million dollars. And I think that we have to reiterate that because they're gonna try to say that it's everything in the moon and it's not. Um, and if it was, this would not pass. The reality is, this is what we were pushing for, and that's what we're going to do, second homes over a million dollars. Go ahead. With that said, going back to the amendment, again, it is so broad. It's investment real property does not state $1 million and over. And if um, some legislators have expressed that, they may have been, that may have been last session. I don't know, maybe that might have been the intent, but intent cha may change. Uh, the composition of the legislature will change. It already did after the primaries. Uh, maybe not next session, but the following session. It gives a blank check for the legislature to tax any property, not only $1 million and over, but below. And that applies to both residential and commercial. Okay, let me get on to some, some viewer questions because I want to respect our viewers who have gotten the trouble of calling us. Caller owns investment property and she is willing to pay the tax to support public education. Um, question for Sherry, does the business community recognize the toll that high, high teacher turnover takes on Hawaii public school students? Well, we recognize it, and again, we support teachers. All we're asking is, you know, have the DOE reevaluate, find out where there's resources not being spent and where their resources spent, where they could redirect resources. And a few sessions ago, the legislature did pass legislation that would help DOE raise revenue. Uh, so that's another option. Going back to How this How would the DOE again, do that? What's the idea? So there is an Act 55, which allows underutilized DOE land uh, to be developed for affordable um, housing, maybe for teachers, maybe for your, for your members. Is uh, that also, an alternative that would help? And where are they going to get the money to build those buildings? And that's the well, problem. Well, private investors. Well, and, and the right. private investors, are there, they, if they had it, they would do it. It does not work. And that's why we're in this situation. There is no magic bullet. And, and in fact, Sherry, the one thing is that businesses would benefit. I mean, you should be on this side of the table uh, because, you know, by investing in kids, that means you're investing in your employees. In fact, one of the best things around the world is that people, when they invest in education, it improves the economy, it lowers social costs. The business community should be the biggest supporters of increasing revenue for our schools and for our keiki. Okay, so. I do understand, okay. again, this, the way it's written, going back to the amendment, <clears throat> applies to all property, and this could inf increase the cost of living for everybody, including teachers. Is it fair to say that this amendment does place a lot of trust in the legislature? <clears throat> I think when you look at this, you have to look at what has been the conversation. And, and look, what is the intent of this? Uh, we already have a residential A rate in Hawaii, and we do tax second homes over a million dollars. But even then, we still have the lowest property tax rate in the entire country. Uh, this becomes a haven for millionaires to come into Hawaii and to use our aina as a commodity without giving back. OK, another caller question, um, interesting question asked to please elaborate on what bills have gone to the legislature to increase funding. And I think that we're talking about bills that things have been tried before that did not get to the legislature. You, your, your union and supporters have tried other things. What other things have been rejected by the legislature? You know, there's not many choices. Uh, we tried a GET and then the counties came in and used that for rail. Um, there's not many choices. Uh, and if you look at it, Hawaii is last in property taxes. And 
The one thing that's frustrating is I think we've been like six or seven questions talking about taxation, and we're not even talking about education. And I think that's often missed, is that we constantly keep on forgetting what the purpose of this is. And this is to make sure that every child doesn't go to school and year after year not have a qualified teacher. I mean, the long-term impact of that is really what we need to be talking about. Let me about. go back to a question that, that uh, Corey answered earlier about the size of the surcharge on this class of property, mm -hmm. the class of property they're expecting the legislature would hit them with. You guys have some lobbying clout yourselves at the legislature. What would, if, if this passes, what would you be lobbying for that would be the appropriate use of this tax? Well, again, we support public education, and that's something we need to look at to see what the legislature introduces and evaluate what it does and the impact it does. does it, and is it going to drive up the cost of living for everybody because a bill passes? So you would and argue that this, that, I mean, if the voters pass this, there's going to be a lot of pressure at the legislature to actually put some money into it. Is there a degree to which the, com the Chamber of Commerce would support some of this? And that's something we're open for discussion. We don't know, again, what version of the bill is going to come out, and that's how we look at bills that get introduced each session. We need to evaluate both sides. And uh, again, this bill, though, it gives authority for the legislature to tax any property. What happens if there is a recession where they need money? Will they now amend the bill, amend the bill, uh, law so that it does go below the $1 million threshold? And the counties as well. The counties sole source of revenue is through real property tax. I need to and respond to that, please. Okay, all right, okay. quickly. First of all, I feel that no matter what way we try to generate revenue, the Chamber of Commerce uh, is gonna come out against it. Um, second of all, this does not take one dollar away from the counties. Uh, and that's, well, again, that's, that's one of those attacks that's very frustrating because, again, it's a fear tactic to try to divide people. It's not gonna take one dollar away from the county. Well, okay, here's a question that did come in from a viewer. What are the proposed impacts to county real property revenues if the constitutional amendment is passed? Now, I know that this is on top of their current exactly. revenue, but doesn't it, in reality, make it even, if this is being taken out, it would make it harder for them to raise or, or do this for the county purposes, right? No, it wouldn't. Uh, it doesn't touch that at all. In fact, the easiest way to compare it is when you go to the gas, tank and you pay a surcharge for local, state, and federal. Uh, they're independent of each other. Um, and the counties would still have 90% of the market that's not even touched by this. So they would have plenty of opportunity. It does not take $1 uh, from the counties at all. Do you, are you guys, um, have the counties lined up with you on this? Well, if the counties do oppose it, but if that's the case, and but the states, this passes and the states now has authority to uh, place a surcharge on investment real property, that's an additional tax. So again, that's going to drive up the cost of uh, housing, uh, business leases, okay, commercial but, property. Okay, I, I, I want to get to a couple of questions. Okay, um, do a lottery. People are moving away because of the high cost of living. Do a lottery. A lot of states have lotteries for education. Do you guys, would you guys have supported that if that was an alternative? So we've looked at that too. Uh, it, it sounds good at first. About $240 million would be brought in a lottery, but about 70% of that actually goes to pay for the lottery. Uh, and, and what happens is, is that 50% of all lottery actually taxes the bottom 20%. And the reality is in Hawaii, the poor actually pay more, a uh, higher percent of their uh, income than the rich do. And that's because the property taxes. Do you think, know, knowing what you know about legislators, that if they had this opportunity, that they would use this money to, to actually reduce the amount of general funding that goes to schools so that they could take money from property taxes and then take the money from general funds that's now going to schools and use it on their programs? Is that something you suspect they would do? Potentially, potentially, right? We don't know what the intent of the legislature will be next session or the following session, but we do know that this amendment will allow them the opportunity to provide a increase, a place, excuse me, place a tax on any level of uh, real investment so property. So to translate and, that question to you is, do you have a fear that the legislature will just give you this, give schools the same amount of money overall, but just use the property tax, and then, then the legislature has a big pot of money to play with. That might happen, but I can guarantee you 100% that if this fails, we're not gonna have any more money. And I think this is the message that we need to send as a public. We need, through this vote, say to legislators that education is important, and that's just a larger issue. We don't disagree public education is important at all. Uh, but again, we just as don't As long as know. we don't fund it. There's no guarantee that this money will go to public education. 
because like you mentioned earlier, they could potentially reduce the DOE $2 billion budget because this income is coming in from uh, the investment real property surcharge. And so we don't know. Why, why, are you, why is it we, we, you have to do this, find another source of revenue for schools? Why is it the legislature won't fund the schools adequately? We are the only state-funded school district. The entire system is broken because, again, we're the only ones that don't use property taxes. In the mainland, about 45% of all revenue comes in from property taxes to pay for our schools. And because of what happened 100 years ago, that's why it's broken now, and that's why our schools are so underfunded. Um, and, you know, right now, it's just too many kids. There's just, we don't have the basics. And I'm telling you, as a teacher, um, I taught in classrooms that were 100 degrees with 40 kids, broken desks, 30-year-old textbooks that were falling apart, and every year the teacher next to me would be leaving. And that's the situation that we're in. That's why it's so desperate. That's why we need to pass this. Okay. Last word for you. As I stated earlier, this amendment, if it passes, it will increase the cost of living, it will increase the real property tax, and it will impact affordable housing, just because it is so broadly written that we don't know what the consequences will be. We don't know what the intent of the legislature will be next session or following sessions. But once a con am in, is in place, it will be very difficult to reverse it. Okay, thanks very much, and thanks to all of you for listening, and mahalo to all of you for joining us, and we thank our guest, Corey Rosenlee, from HSDA and Sherry Menor McNamara, CEO of the Chamber of Commerce. Next week on Insights, we are back to our candidate forums. We start with the at-large seats for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. There are three seats and six candidates. It should be a very lively show. Hope you join us. I'm Daryl Huff for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Ahui ho.